important. Uh, it has lots of applications uh, in fuel cells, in batteries, uh, electrocatalysis, uh, electrolysis, uh, uh, photocatalytic water splitting is a very interesting subject. So it's like artificial uh, uh, nature. Uh, uh, nature, but there are also processes that you want to rather convert, con con uh, uh, avert, uh, which is a corrosion. Uh, and then even in the life sciences, if you look at processes at cell membranes, there you might also have some kind of uh, electrochemical processes. And uh, what are so the challenges in the theoretical description? Again, I emphasize from an atomic po uh, optimistic point of view, first of all, a liquid is a liquid. And if you uh, from as from a surface science point of view, uh, enter the realm of solid liquid interfaces. Uh, as a theoretician, no longer can you use your nice tool of just pushing a button and look at min energy minimum structure. Now you have to perform statistical averages over many different structures, and uh, in principle, also instead of total energies, free energies have to be uh, calculated. Second. In electrochemistry, again, from if you uh, convert from a surface scientist to electrochemist, uh, there's another control parameter that is not uh, present in uh, gas solid interfaces, uh, which is the, elect uh, the electrode potential, and uh, which this also requires to deal with variations in the charge of the electrodes, which is uh, rather uh, adds uh, severe complexity, uh, complexity uh, as uh, from a theoretical point of view to the treatment. And, and this is what I will emphasize. Uh, in fact, the electrolyte also corresponds to a reservoir of ions. Uh, so, and uh, you, sh you should not ne neglect the interaction of these ions with the electrodes, which might also severely uh, change the surface structure. And uh, I also agree with Jörg that even the model systems, especially oxides, can be very complicated in contact with an electrolyte. So, in principle, we know what we do, should do. We just should uh, use, uh, uh, perform reliable quantum chemistry calculation of these interfaces under potential control with appropriate number of electrolyte molecules considered and their statistical nature taken into account for averaging over sufficiently long epidemiological molecular dynamics simulation. So this is what we are supposed to do. But unfortunately, such an approach is currently not possible and uh, it's questionable whether ever it ever will be possible. Uh, due to technical and, of course, numerical obstacles, uh, these are just time, much too time consuming uh, these, uh, to perform this simulation. And also with respect to potential control, there's still lots of work to do to get the proper technique. So now let's start looking at the electrical double layer. And uh, there, of course, you are all were, uh, well aware of these models. In principle, we often still use concepts that are 100 years old in order to describe what it, how electrical double layer looks like. The first model was by Helmholtz, uh, where he just assumed that there is a layer of iron uh, in front of the surface. Uh, and uh, then there was uh, also later the model by Gu and Chapman, which introduced a diffuse layer. And Stern combined these two models where you first have this Helmholtz layer, and then you have a diffuse layer uh, 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 of, in the electrolyte. And to be honest, I, I have the feeling that our current understanding of the electric double layer is still based on the Stern model. And the question is whether we should go beyond this uh, kind of uh, still continuum based uh, model to describe electrical double layer. Uh, so now this is my my technologically slide. So what we are doing and what I will present in this uh, talk are uh, studies where we uh, performed periodic density functional theory calculation. Now we are looking at solid liquid interfaces and uh, we are using periodic codes and these periodic codes have to be periodic in three dimensions. Uh, but of course, uh, a surface or interface breaks this dimension. So artificially we describe an interface uh, by this procedure in a supercell approach. So the electrode or the surface is uh, described by a slab. Then we have here a layer uh, in between, which we can fill in surface science, we would just have vacuum, but here we have now the electrolyte and then the next uh, uh, cell starts where we have the same setup. Now there are two parameters that can kind of easily controlled. Of course, we want the slabs to be thick enough to be good models for electrodes or surfaces. So we just check uh, whether the results depend on the thickness. We also want this interface, uh, this region between this, uh, the two layers to the slabs to be large enough. This is again 
uh, practical done by, by just increasing the distance and looking whether the results change. Of course, the problems with all these key calculations that can't be solved that easily is the functional. And most of the results that I will present are related to metal surfaces or metal electrodes, where typically GDA uh, uh, functionals, uh, generalized gradient approximation are, are, are valid. And another uh, slide uh, related to the particular technology. Of course, now we have to describe not only the substrates, but also the liquid and mainly aqueous electrolytes. And there it turns out that in fact, uh, the RPBE D3 functional is uh, rather well suited. It not only describes little water cluster, not only describes ice uh, structures, but it also describes the liquid uh, properties of water very well and also liquid water interfaces. So this is uh, most of these uh, uh, calculations that I have will, will present have been performed with this particular functional. Okay, now let me go back. Let me go back 15 years ago to the early start when surface scientists start becoming interested, at least theoretical surface scientists into uh, water metal in interfaces. And uh, first one realized that if you have this close packed hexagonal metal surfaces, an ice-like bilayer fits very nicely on top of this surface. But now there's now, uh, in, in fact, in this particular structure, uh, typically, every second water molecule binds through this oxygen atom, which would also be the structure of a water monomer. But in order to have the, to the, the tetragonal structuring of an order of water, uh, one in fact uh, can't bind the second water molecule. So either they are with the hydrogen atom up or with the hydrogen atom down in order to have this uh, typical ice-like layer. And in, interestingly enough, these two ice-like layer are energetically almost degenerate. But there's one quantity where they differ quite significantly, which is their, the induced work function change or their, the dipole. And of course, it's, it's easy to imagine that these layers here have a dipole depending whether the hydrogen atoms show up or show down. And so you would expect, so to say, they, there is an, there's an, the work function upon introducing such a layer would either go up or go down. Interestingly, for example, if you go to platinum 101, there is a huge work function change by 2 EV, but both water layer configurations lower the work function. So this is strange. Also, what I want to stress here at this point is that later at this point, at this talk, I will come back that the work function can directly be related to the electrode potential. And the work function change by 2 EV means this change is larger than the stability window of water. So this is really a severe number. But, but why is uh, why uh, do both structure lower the work function? And uh, at the time we performed electronic structure calculation, and what is plotted here is the so-called charge density different plot. And what you plot here is the the charge of the interacting system minus the charge of the components at the same position, but uh, in a non-interacting way. And interestingly enough. For both structures, what you find is that there is a kind of electron flow from the water layer towards the re region between the first platinum layer and the water. Of course, you have to be careful where exactly the platinum starts, but, but you see that there is, an, in both cases, a dipole due to the strong polarization of the water. Uh, and there are two points about it. So first of all, this also means that this is a very important component in modeling the surfaces. So in principle, you need quantum chemistry in order to describe the surface. Force field models of, uh, of these interfaces would not capture this. And uh, as, as uh, electrochemistry is all about electrode potential and thus work function changes, this is very important to take into account. So in principle, what you have here at this water layer is a kind of lowering of the work function due to the strong polarization in both cases. And then on top of it, you have this two different dipole orientation, which make this strong change. Now, I want to show you some trajectory that we also performed 10 years ago and uh, where we wanted, we started to look at properties that we were considered would be properties of liquid water. And I want you to focus at this hydrogen molecule. So we looked at the hydrogen dissociation in the, in the presence of a water layer. And I want you also to follow this particular hydrogen atom here. And you see it almost moves freely uh, at this platinum surface. From surface science study, it's known that there are hardly any diffusion there for hydrogen from platinum 101. But even in the presence of the water layer, 
this almost move freely. Interestingly enough, this other one stays here. And also what you see here is you see constant re rearrangement of the structure. Uh, there are hydrogen lines forming in north. So, so this was rather interesting. Uh, and so in principle, what we have modeled was such a structure. We had a two layer of water on top of a platinum surface. And now I'm telling the anecdote that I've uh, already told a couple of times. I'm sorry for those who have already heard this. When I showed this picture 10 years ago to the late Professor Kolb, he said, what you have, doing, have been doing is, has nothing to do with electrochemistry. And why is this not really related to electrochemistry? Is because what we should have done was a simulation like that. At low electro potentials, uh, platinum 111 in the, in the presence of an well, aqueous electrolyte is always hydrogen coupled. And so this, the important point is that when you do simulations, you better make sure that you, you get the right surface structure and also the right adsorbate structure. And this was my point that I made in the, in the beginning, that it's important that uh, you, you have to consider the, your electrolyte as a reservoir, even if you think you have just water, you still have a certain pH value. Yeah, there are, there are uh, protons and uh, hydroxide ion, and ions to the surface, and you have to take into account this. But how can you determine the stable structure, this thermal equilibrium structure here at the surface? And it turns out that it's not that complicated. And let me start with uh, a grand canonical scheme that was written down by Carsten Reuter and uh, Matthias Schaeffler uh, 20 years ago, which was first, re it's related to uh, heterogeneous catalysis, so to the interface between a catalyst material and a gas phase, because it's conceptual a uh, little bit easier. And in principle, what you want to model is the structure here of this interface. So in principle, as I told you before, and in fact, also here, we have to determine free energies and we, ha uh, we have to determine the free energy of absorption, which is the uh, surface energy with the adsorbate minus, minus the, the surface energy of the clean substrate. And then uh, typically what one then does is when one writes down this formula, uh, then here, and this is why it's only approximate, here you replace the free energy expression by the total energy. Why can you do this? Uh, Carsten uh, made a careful job in, job in looking at it because often entropy terms and also put, uh, uh, pressure terms do not really depend, uh, influence the energies very much. And then you have this expression. And from this expression, you can then derive surface energy diagrams as a function of temperature and pressure. But I wanna, what, what, what I want to stress here is that here the temperature and pressure dependence only comes from the dependence of the chemical potential in the gas phase. Here, the, these terms, the adsorption, the structures here uh, are assumed to be hardly dependent on the on temperature and pressure. This is not a fold of the grand canonical approach. This is just an approximation of uh, made in this particular uh, in this particular application of the grand canonical scheme. But now, of course, we are talking about electrochemistry. So we have no gas phase where we can, in fact, easily calculate the energy of the free, for example, molecules O2 or H2. We have here an electrolyte. And the electrolyte is much, much more complicated because now our reference state is no longer the free molecule in the gas phase, but it's the solvated species. And this is much more complicated. But in fact, there's also a way out and which has been uh, 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 proposed by Jens Nersko. And again, this is in principle only again a combination of a grand canonical approach together with an atomistic viewpoint. Here again, we have here the scheme which is, uh, uh, is, is assumed or is used in this so-called ab initio thermodynamics uh, for uh, heterogeneous catalysis. So you assume you have equilibrium through all, throughout all your system. But now what, what Jens uh, kind of realized uh, was that typically uh, uh, you have to, as I mentioned, you have to consider the solvated species, but typically many of these solvated species uh, are, are also in equilibrium with their, uh, with their uh, corresponding gas phase species so through their standard potentials. And so in principle, you have here now a new equilibrium. And now again, you can determine here the, the stable structure uh, as a function of the electrochemical potential, where as a reference state, you can again take uh, the corresponding uh, species in the gas phase, which again makes it computation a little bit easier. 
And so this is in principle, the basic idea of this so-called computational hydrogen electrode and uh, the stun uh, and the basic uh, approximation, or no, no, it's no approximation. The basic uh, uh, fundamental relation is that there are conditions where the uh, proton and solution is equilibrium with uh, the hydrogen gas in gas phase. And uh, of course, this is a very special situation, but we also know how to extend this to other to conditions where we have finite pH value and electric potentials. We just know how our electrochemical potential changes as a function of electro potential and pH value. And this is not only valid for hydrogen. In fact, this is also valid for any uh, solvated species where you have some kind of redox potential. And I've taken here the, uh, the, the example of chlorine, where you have the chloride, solvated chloride anion. And this is then equilibrium with the chloride, uh, uh, chloride uh, Ryan uh, gas, and then you just look up a table and find that the uh, standard electro potential is 1.36 uh, volt versus the standard hydrogen electrode. And then again, also you can derive here the electrochemical potential of the chloride anion uh, in the solution as a function of electro potential and concentration, or better said, here the activity. And then you can calculate free energy absorption. And again, here. Here is the approximation that in principle you also need here the free energy, but typically since free energies are hard to calculate, one uses here the total energy. But often what I want to stress here is that in principle within this grand canonical concept, this is all exact and the approximations are just made here. So the approximation are not in the concept of the computation hydrogen electrode, but just in the particular calculation uh, used to uh, apply this concept. Okay, let me give you now an example of this. And the example that I want to give is rather simple. It's simple, uh, it's chlorine on copper 101. And here are all experiments uh, 20, more than 20 years ago. And the interesting point about this one I here make is that even if you have kind of a very, uh, or a uh, uh, um, solution and uh, uh, very uh, dilute the solution of chloride in, in the electrolyte, immediately you have a, a square root three times square root three layer on the surface. So, and of course, if you have this dense layer, it's totally different whether you have a clean copper surface or this dense layer. And this is uh, the point I wanna make here. Now, how do we address this? Again, we do now the typical approximation that I mentioned before the adsorption of these chlora of these halides here on the surface, we do calculation, which in principle corresponds to uh, UHV calculations. We just calculate the absorption energies of these halogen atoms on top of the surface. Why do we dare to neglect the presence of the electrolyte here in this calculation? Because what you see here is in principle a calculation of a chloride layer on platinum 101 uh, with the coverage of one third. And you see here the water, the, the, the layer is so dense that there are no water molecules entering this uh, chloride layer. And so the water is just flowing above it and it's a weak interaction. And that's why the principle of the adsorption energies of this chloride uh, only weakly depend on this presence of the water molecules. But we will come later to example where these, the presence matters. And then what we calculated is just the adsorption energies of all these halides on top of the surface. And all what I will present in the following is just the consequence of these numbers. Everything I will show you is hidden here but of course it's then not easy to detect. So we find, first of all, that typically the adsorption energies, uh, which are the adsorption energies per atom, uh, become, they, they become less negative. So adsorption becomes weaker for higher coverage. This is of course well understood due to the repulsion. But again, what is now the thermodynamically stable structure is hard to see from this particular uh, presentation. And so what we just then uh, do is we, is we uh, we apply this grand canonical scheme. We also apply it, in fact, not just to one species because we want to take into account that both protons and uh, halide anions are in the solution. And then we have a two dimensional pro uh, problem. And so then every space will be, uh, will be represented by a plane in this hypersurface here. And then this plane with the lowest energy as a function of uh, the electrochemical potentials will be the most stable structure on this. And so what we then do when we start the structure, we perform many, many different calculations of surface structure. And then we apply this, uh, the computation hydrogen electrode 
And as a function of the electrochemical potential of chloride and of uh, hydrogen, we can plot the stable phases. Now, of course, you might say, uh, if you if I if you show this to an experimentalist and says, uh, yeah, please uh, do the experiment at this electrochemical potential, he will have, the the experiment will have certain problems because typically you specify your pH value or the electropotential. But everything is in principle included in this phase diagram. For example, if for for fixed concentration of protons and halides, you change the electropotential, you would go along this red line. And this is shown here in the next uh, slide, or oh, sorry, uh, in, the, in this slide here. So if you just do a cut along this uh, line here, then you can plot the stable structures. And the interesting point here is the following. So you find that at low electrode potential, hydrogen, uh, hydrogen uh, platinum becomes hydrogen covered, as I mentioned in the beginning. And it, in, the, in the absence of any other anions, the, uh, the, the hydrogen, uh, the platinum 101 would be hydrogen covered up to this potential energies, uh, to, to this electrode potential. But interestingly, already here, it's more stable to have a chloride layer on the surface, in the surface. And that's what is uh, kind, of, this is why hydrogen and chlorine have a so called competitive character. Here at this particular point, hydrogen is replaced by chlorine. And this has been identified in experiments and is nicely reproduced in our calculations. And in fact, also, you can convert this into something that is uh, more helpful in order to talk to experimentalists. You can also derive probe diagrams. This is just a kind of a transformation of this. And then you can also show here uh, uh, the probe diagram, uh, where here you have the hydrogen covered. And then here you have this competitive absorption. And here you would have this chlorine uh, layer uh, on top of the surface. Note that on platinum one on one, the not the squared three times squared three structure, but the more complex structure is more stable. Okay, but this was still a rather simple system. Now, when we come to uh, to system where we do not have just atoms but molecular absorption, like in the case of sulfate and bisulfate absorption, it's a little bit more complicated because now the molecules are protruding from the surface, and here the presence of the water molecules can't be neglected anymore. And in principle, it's even much more, it's complicated. So what we find and what I will show in the end that if you absorb uh, sulfate and bisulfate in this, uh, in this kind of row-like structure this has been observed in the experiments, this will be strongly stabilized by the presence of this water molecules of this water rows on top of this, uh, on the surface. And in principle, this is also in like ice-like layer, if you wish, these water molecules are no longer liquid they are strongly absorbed by binding energy of like almost one EV. And so they are here, they kind of stabilize this row like structure. And on top of this, still we have this dipole moment, we used implicit solvent model. I will come back to this issue in, in a moment later. And so again, we now did this for on platinum 101 and gold 101. And again, we found the surface uh, phase diagrams here, uh, the stable structure uh, for platinum 101 and gold 111, of course. This is uh, again, not very helpful. And we converted this to poor B diagrams. And this is what we then find here. And so again, here at low electrode potential, platinum source hydrogen covered. Then you have this so-called double layer region, which is uh, experimental, very known. And then we have this, uh, this sulfate uh, structure here, the row like structure. And uh, in fact, we almost got a quantitative agreement with experiments, even this curvature here, along this uh, borderline is, uh, uh, is reproduced uh, uh, with respect to the surface. Now, with respect to gold, gold doesn't like to, uh, doesn't bind hydrogen that strongly. So you have a clean surface where rather strong. And then you have a region here where uh, within our unit cell, we found many different, different structures. And then only here, this, uh, this row-like structure becomes, uh, became stable. And in fact, Experimentally, there has been a disorder order transition uh, be observed uh, at about one volt. And this is nicely also reproduced here in our calculations. And uh, to emphasize this, I also uh, have here the recent, so oh, sorry about that, recent results uh, here published in JAX, where they ex exactly address the same system. So you see here now the cyclic voltammogram. You have here this uh, in STM, you can absorb diff diffuse layers. And then here, this spikes corresponds to this order disorder transition. And also here, these colleagues calculated this row-like structure and confirmed this. 
So again, a very nice agreement between uh, theory and experiment. Okay, but now, so now let's move on to, uh, to really a liquid structure because eventually we want to really model and understand how does, does the electrical double layer look like? And uh, if you're interested in a mystic point of view, there's no way out, but just to explicitly include the water layer. And so here is a snapshot of the simulation with, that we run, where we used a six by six surface unit cell and uh, with six layers of water, so we're at 144 water molecules. So this was rather time consuming, and I will show you eight trajectories that we performed here, and each of them ran on one a particular uh, node on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a computer for almost half a year. And uh, the important point also is that we monitored the work function because the work function is directly related to the electro potential of this uh, structure. And again, also what we then plotted here is the potential. And you see here also this oscillatory structure. And again, this shows you already that this may be this just uh, decaying uh, potential uh, in our pictures of the electrical double layer might not be uh, really the whole story. Uh, in an opportunistic description, you would also get this kind of facility structure due to the layer structures of these uh, uh, water layers on top of this platinum 101 surface. Now, let's look at the simulations in more detail. Two years before we performed this large structure, uh, large simulations, we already did uh, uh, simulations at this with the same time length, but only in a in a three by three water cell. And in fact, here what you see is the variation of the work function along this run. And interestingly, what you find here now is that uh, the smaller the cell, the, the larger the variation is. So in principle, we have had almost twice the variation of this union cell. Now there's an interesting question, whether you now, and as, as I said, if you do simulations for a particular structure, you relate the work function to the particular structure, would you now average over these and take the corresponding electro potential to be the mean value? Or would you just say, uh, okay, every single, uh, uh, configuration belongs to another electro potential. And this is in principle a question that uh, it's discussion that you might, uh, uh, might you, you still have to, uh, to, to, to follow. And uh, we, so we decided in fact, to just consider our simulations to be representative of, uh, of, a, of a system with the means, uh, with, the, with, uh, with the electro potential corresponding to the mean for function here, because in principle, we still have finite unit cells and as long as these are symmetric, you can say, okay, whenever you have a structure here, you might have the next structure uh, uh, with the opposite, uh, with the with the another electro potential, and this would then average out. Okay, now to show you how one can relate this work function to the electro potential, uh, here you see here now different structures, and here we have the work function that we calculated. Uh, you know, on, uh, with respect to the vacuum level. And here you can see how we then can derive the corresponding electro potential. And here you see the different trajectories that you performed. So this was just a clear water layer. Then we added one hydrogen atom in the water layer. And then what, what automatically happens is that we form hydronium ion. And uh, in fact, the uh, surface becomes uh, negatively charged. And uh, that's why then also the corresponding electro potential lowers. The opposite is, is when we take away one hydrogen atom, then we form an hydroxyl ion in the layer and charge is flowing from the surface to the, to the, uh, to the water layer. And by this, we change the dipole moment and we change the corresponding work functions. And uh, we then also look at the particular structure of the water layers. And you see here what is plotted here is the, uh, the distribution of the oxygen atom as a function for, of the platinum surface for three different trajectories. And of course, what you also find here is first this peak. And I, but I, in my opinion, uh, this peak is, has nothing to do with some strand bonding. Whenever you have a flat surface like this here, you have a stage, and then you will have a certain layer of, mole, uh, of, of electrolyte molecules here at the surface, and this leads to, and then to the first peak. But interestingly enough, we find that this distribution becomes already rather flat from the second water layer on. So we would dare to say that already from the second layer on, the, this water here is rather liquid-like uh, 
for this particular situation. So you see here also we performed a structure where we had a full hydrogen covered surface, which you see here, you can see that uh, these water layers are a little bit farther away from the surface due to the passivation of the platinum surface. And here, I'm sorry that this uh, is so small, but what we plotted here is the following. Along this trajectory, the 40 picoseconds, we monitored the oxygen atoms. And so we have here now uh, strongly bound oxygen uh, atoms of the water molecules, which we call here the solution A structure. We have weakly bound uh, water molecules in this structure. And what's plotted here is the uh, distribution of the oxygen atoms. And the most important point is there's no single water molecule that stayed the whole 40 picoseconds on top of uh, at the surface. So this means this is a very strongly dynamical uh, system. Water molecules are constantly exchanging from the bulk to the surface and back and forth. So there is no, 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 no uh, fixed structure. Everything is dynamic and changing. The same is true also when we look at these hydrogen covered platinum 1 1 on surface. Now we don't have the strongly bound water molecules anymore. In fact, we have here some water molecules which stay there for a very short period of time, which uh, is a little more strongly bound, but it's not like here on the uncovered surface. And here, even the exchange of the water molecules between the first uh, layer, solvation layer, and here the other layers is even stronger. So uh, the, the important point is. Uh, these are very dynamical systems, this uh, electrolyte layer on top of, uh, of, a, of a surface. And here again, also you see what happens if we uh, have this different situation. Of course, they also change the orientation of the first water molecules. And what we find is, for example, here, when we uh, add a an hydrogen atom and make, uh, the, uh, uh, make the surface uh, more negative, what we in fact find is that the strongly bound, uh, the, the coverage with the strongly bound uh, water molecule is lower uh, compared to the situation when we take away an hydrogen atom, create an, a hydro negatively charged hydroxyl group in the water layer, and uh, then have a positively charged, more positively charged surface, where then this oxygen atom, which is in fact negatively charged, likes to absorb more, uh, more strongly. Uh, here we also looked at the particular structure of the bulk-like layer, but uh, I don't want to discuss this in any more detail. So, but what we find is that we find a more direct, directly, more directly platinum bonded water molecules and higher structuring of water layers uh, at higher potentials. And this is also illustrated here. Here it's so so-called heat maps. It's the distribution of uh, the strong, the directly bonded water molecules with these red points and the diffuse water molecules at the first layer. And the higher the potential, the more red points you see in the less blue area. So we find a more structured layer here in the so-called double layer region uh, at the more positively charged surfaces, which in fact has been also observed in experiments. Okay, and we are not the only one to do these simulations. Uh, here are also other simulations uh, of the group of Chu Cheng, and he, they, in principle, found the same results as we did for the uh, the water layers on platinum 101. Again, here also you see the polarization of the of the first water layer. Uh, interesting enough, if you do the same on gold 111, these uh, the interaction is much weaker, and the polarization also is much weaker. Okay, but now very briefly, uh, implicit solvent. Uh, when you use an implicit solvent, in principle, you replace the explicit solvent by an water, uh, by, by a continuum. My PhD supervisor says, once told me there are two ways of doing theory. Either you first calculate and then you average. This would be here with the explicit solvent, or you first average and then you calculate. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, very has become very popular because it's computationally much easier. And we also have done studies like this. We have, for example, looked at the uh, initial steps of the methanol electrooxidation on platinum 101 in implicit solvent, and found also trends that uh, this barrier for the initial dehydroxination step towards methoxy is increased in the presence of the implicit solvent because this uh, methoxy loses this uh, stabilizing hydrophilic OH group, uh, while if you do a, C, a CH bond uh, breaking, you still find this step. So qualitatively, this is very nice. But here, I show you results of our first speaker of our, of our conference, Karen Chan, uh, where she, she looked at 
the adsorption energies in the presence of implicit solvent and explicit solvent. And you, these are these black and red symbols here. And you see, looking at the particular system, sometimes <clears throat> the, uh, the implicit solvent, the results are above the implicit, sometimes they are below. So one must still say that there is uh, the, 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 their difference up to 0.6 EV in the solvation energies between implicit and flexit solvent. So certainly we need to work on the accuracy and reliability of our implicit solvent models anymore. So now in the last minutes, let me change gears a little bit and uh, talk about electrochemical interfaces and batteries. But first of all, I want to stress one important point. So what's the driving force for lithium ion battery? And in fact, if you look at uh, what happens uh, eventually in a, in a lithium uh, ion uh, battery upon discharging, or in principle upon delithiation of the anode, is that you transfer lithium atoms from the anode to the cathode. And the driving force of the lithium ion battery is the fact that the lithium atoms are more strongly bound in the cathode than in the anode. Now, if you build up the, electro, uh, the battery, you introduce here an electrolyte. An electrolyte is per definition an ion conductor. So the ions can go across here, but the poor electrons have to take a detour. But thermodynamically, again, in principle, the electrons and the lithium cation recombine here in the cathode. And uh, so thermodynamically, in principle, this process is not an electrochemical reaction. That's why we also can calculate the so-called open circuit voltage very easily with DFT methods, because we just in principle have to calculate the difference between the intercalation energy of lithium in the cathode and the anode. And from this energy difference divided by the number of charge carriers, we can directly de derive the open circuit voltage. Why do I tell you this? Because here, uh, you, this is again, one can also re-express re -express the open circuit voltage through the chemical potential of lithium in the anode in the cathode. And this is now taken from a, uh, from a JAX article of uh, our last year Nobel Prize laureate John Goodenough. And you see here the electrochemical uh, the potential of the lithium in the anode and the cathode. And then also here, you have here the homolumo gap of the electrolyte. But, but stop for a moment. I mean, can you plot something like that? I mean, this are, what is this? This are chemical potentials. This are here, uh, uh, homo lumo, these are electronic properties. These are atomic properties. Can you do this like that? And there's another point also. Good enough, all that always has stressed the fact that in order for the electrolyte to be stable, the homo lumo get has to be larger than this difference between the electrode potentials of, uh, of the lithium in the cathode in the end node. Uh, but in fact, this is a misconception. So this tells you already that Nobel Prize laureates are not always uh, right, because uh, first of all, the question is what potential is meant here and how can you compare this? And second, it's in fact not the homo lumo gap that determines the stability of electrolyte. The simplest example is water. Water, uh, it's, it's not that easy, but I mean, uh, uh, Mikkel Spick is the ex exper uh, ex uh, expert for the homo lumo gap of water, but it's in the range of eight uh, EV. But you know the electrostability window of water is just 1.3 volts. So it's not the, it's not the homo lumo gap, but it's in fact the redox potentials. And you can very uh, nicely see this in this particular paper where this kind of misconception is being correct. On the other hand, that you can plot this, 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 uh, levels here is still to a certain extent right. And this is will, what I will show you in the next foils. So now, of course, what you can do is when you write down the chemical potential of lithium in the anode and the cathode, you can decompose them into the electrochemical potential of the lithium cation and of the electrode. Now, what you can do is again, now let's do a Gedanken experiments. Let's again consider anode and cathode. And as I told you, thermodynamically, in principle, you transfer a lithium atom from the anode to the cathode. Now, again, I then decomposed here uh, the, the, electrochemi the chemical potential of lithium atom into these two electrochemical potentials. I had no idea where to put them. Uh, I, I just made sure that the sum of these here uh, just corresponds to the number. Now, 
What we do in the next step in our Gedanken experiment, we do use, uh, we introduce the electrolyte. Now, what happens uh, when we introduce the electrolyte? Now, we, you can we try to answer the question, but in order to, to, uh, to go on with this talk, if you use the introduced electrolyte, you introduce an ion conductor here. So ions can enter this, uh, the field in between, and uh, ions will then, in fact, enter from the anode and the cathode into the electrolyte. And what at the end we have here is then that, of course, after some time, there has to be a thermodynamical equilibrium between the electrochemical potential of the lithium cation in the anode and the cathode. Because again, otherwise there would be there would be a const, there would be still a flow going on. And now, but how can these two electrochemical potentials of the lithium cations be aligned due to the introduction of electrical double layers? These electrical double layers will build at these interfaces and will then lead to the fact that in principle now these two electrochemical potentials are aligned. But now, what happens to the electrons? And the important point is that the electrons, of course, are also charged particles. Here you have uh, singly charged cations. Here you have negatively charged uh, electrons. And of course, they feel exactly the same electric double layer. And you have to note that also electrostatic forces are a long range. So no matter which way you go, the, these, these uh, electrons will always feel this electric fields. And in fact, by the same amount, by which the, the electrochemical potential of the cations have been pushed together by the same amount, the electrochemical potentials of the electrons will be pushed, pushed apart from each other. And this in fact leads to the fact that in this open circuit voltage uh, situation, the electrochemical potentials of the lithium cations aligned and all the whole energy difference corresponding to the open circuit voltage has to be between the two Fermi energies of the electrons in the N node and the cathode. And so the very first step, when the very first electron flows, it will recombine here with this lithium cation and then uh, 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 gain this particular energy here. Of course, then afterwards it becomes more complicated. So uh, what, why I kind of I tell you the story is here that uh, I will also stress the important role that electrochemical double layer play in batteries. And it's my observation that often I think these electric group double layer are just neglected and not really properly taken into account in the, in the battery field. Now, uh, I just want to also stress some, some applications of this uh, grand canonical concept. Uh, the first example I want to give you is with respect to aqueous thin metal batteries. And in fact, these are promising complementary technologies. In principle, you would like to have aqueous batteries because they do not burn these electrolytes, but of course, uh, they can only sustain a small uh, 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 voltage here. But zinc batteries, fortunately, have an, an, uh, typically voltage below one volt, so they, you can, ru can run them uh, as an aqueous battery. But the problem was still that the intercalation mechanism was strongly uh, uh, discussed or uh, debated in this uh, zinc metal batteries. With, and it was the question whether it's are the zinc cations or the protons that are intercalated in a, in a cooperation with the group of Stefano Passerini, we're looking at this particular system. And in fact, they just looked, uh, used uh, fresh batteries. And what you see here is that there are some things going on in this uh, the first, very first three cycles. But then uh, with respect to the next 2000 cycles, uh, little is going on. So there are some kind of activation process in the first cycles, but then these batteries have a good cyclability. But still the question is, what are the charge carriers entering the, this uh, cathode? In fact, they used here vanadium cathode. And we did calculations for that, both for water-free uh, uh, vanadium and uh, uh, vanadium with structural water. And you know that vanadium has this kind of layer structures. And what we found here then again as a function of hydrogen chemical potential and also zinc chemical potential is that both zinc and hydrogen can intercalate so, and uh, there was also uh, uh, ex experimental ev evidence that they were can, uh, could in intercalate. So there is an unusual uh, proton zinc two plus exchange intercalation, deintercalation mechanism, because both the protons and the zinc cations can intercalate 
uh, in Venedia based the uh, cathodes upon variation of the electric potentials. And this is what we verified here. You see here we have varying uh, zinc and proton uh, content as function of the electro potential. And my last example is about the equilibrium shape of discharge products in lithium air batteries. And this makes context also to York's uh, uh, talk before. Uh, typically in lithium air batteries, uh, lithium peroxidized, peroxide is considered to be, be the main discharge product in lithium air batteries. And its deposits are believed to be the main reason for the premature deaths of lithium air batteries. That's why it's uh, interesting to look at the particular shape of this lithium peroxide particles. And what's plotted here is uh, the results of our calculation that just have been published in this paper here uh, of, the, of the equilibrium shape of uh, these lithium peroxide particles. And as a function of uh, oxygen partial, uh, pressure or chemical potential, you see that this equilibrium change, shape, which we have to determine according to the Wolf construction, strongly changes. And the important point is that, in fact, the oxygen, the, 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 the stability of this surface is changed as a function of oxygen chemical potential. And the higher the chemical potential is, the more uh, oxygen covered the surfaces are. And interesting, you see this here also for these high potentials, you find the surfaces which become uh, oxygen terminated. And also, interestingly enough, you see the surface look pretty rough. We find that this high index surface terminations become uh, surprisingly stable at, uh, at these uh, high surface temperatures. And in fact, uh, what uh, these have been overlooked. And if you take them into account, you get this kind of complicated full shapes. OK, this is what I wanted to tell you today. And let me briefly summarize uh, this in a more general sense. So first of all, we all know that it's a very nice field to work in electrochemical uh, electrode electrolyte interfaces because they are scientifically interesting. There are lots of questions to be uh, answered, but of course they are also of high technological relevance with respect to energy storage and conversion. So it's really fun uh, to work in this particular field. But this uh, uh, field has certainly not matured yet, at least from a theoretical point of view. And, uh, with respect to performing first principle simulations under potential control. So for theoreticians, there are still lots of work to do, not only from a numerical point of view, but also still from a fundamental point of view in order to do potential control calculations. And in fact, there has been a kind of, uh, there have been lots of attempts like 20, 10 years ago to do calculations under potential control. I have the feeling there, the, the initiatives have been subdued to a certain uh, extent. And maybe because the computational hydrogen electrode uh, concept was too successful, there is no potential control here. You just do calculations and apply a grand canonical scheme and can nicely reproduce many, many features. And maybe this has kind of uh, uh, decreased the motivation to develop codes uh, which run under potential control. Uh, but of course, my, my other take home message is you just can't do calculations and then just say, okay, let's, let's use petlinum and let's look at the adsorbates. I think any theoretical study addressing electrode electrolyte interfaces first should consider the, the correct equilibrium coverage of the electrode. This you, this you could use, uh, done, do by this computer hydrogen electrode. And uh, uh, approaches employing implicit solvent models are becoming increasingly popular. But uh, their, their reliability and accuracy is hard to assess. Uh, I used to say that they are better than nothing, but certainly we have to assess their accuracy and reliability. And therefore, we, there is certainly a need for numerically demanding ab initio molecular dynamic simulation, uh, just first of all, to gain insights into the structure, but also second, to serve as benchmark studies for this computation less demanding method. OK, and again, of course, I haven't done this work on my own. I needed funding. These are the funding agency that help uh, us perform the studies. We needed computer time from this uh, computer centers here. And of course, we need people. And the people who have uh, particular uh, uh, contributed to this work are Holger, who is sitting here sometimes. Katrin is here. Florian did some nice work. And also Seng did uh, lots of work to the electrochemical interfaces. And then there are these uh, battery uh, studies have been performed by, by, by Benatz and uh, the studies concerning the uh, 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 sulfate have been done by uh, Fernanda. They are not on this picture yet. So this is Fernanda, this is Benatz. So I have to thank all of them for the, their nice work. And I have to thank you for your attention.
and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you very much to you. So the first question is from Navaz, please. Uh, hi, can you listen to me? Yeah, I hear you. Uh, okay, so I saw this nice movie where hydrogen is diffusing over the surface. Uh, and uh, I assume like uh, this is a, a nice, um, you know, classical uh, mm. picture where uh, the hydrogen is on this ordered surface. Yeah. You can find sometimes valleys, sometimes hills. But mm. I'm wondering like, what, what do you think if you add some nuclear quantum effects? Yeah, in fact, yeah, of course, you're very right. And you see here, I, I didn't particularly talk about it, but of course, there's always the issue about nuclear quantum effects in hydrogen motion. Mm -hmm. And you should know that, in fact, I spent 15 years of my scientific life in doing quantum dynamic simulation of hydrogen scattering at metal surfaces. Mm -hmm. So, of course, there are tunneling effects, there are uh, zero point effects, and it might well be that. We, with this particular functional, we can very nicely reproduce this, uh, this pair distribution functions. And it might be a coincidence that we kind of uh, uh, mimic quantum effects in the simulation. Mm -hmm. But in, it's my, with my all experience in quantum effects, of course they are there, but I would dare to say that their role might be minor. And as long as we get the right right uh, uh, right uh, distribution, then we might uh, still get meaningful results. Of course, you should uh, maybe, there are ex more, uh, experts in the audience who are more experienced with respect to polymer ring molecular dynamics simulation. But for the moment being, uh, I would not be so much concerned about nuclear quantum effects, uh, especially when it comes to this electrochemical interfaces. They might play a role when you look underwater under special conditions, uh, but, but this is of course a very valid question and we have to check it. But for the moment being, uh, they, it would be too much time consuming to, to EV, even consider nuclear quantum effects in okay. the hydrogen motion. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the, the next uh, is uh, Jean-Sebastien Filial. Hello. Uh, thank you, Axel, for this very nice talk. I have, I had uh, a small question about uh, the CH, uh, CHE approximations, because the, problem, the, more, the main problem with the CHE is not accounting for the surface capacitance in the basics uh, uh, approach. And that can be somehow problematic when you have different surface with uh, potential of zero charge that are quite different because that means that uh, when you are considering the equilibrium, uh, you would have uh, importance of uh, an important charging of the surface. So the second of the term of the energetics can be important. And somehow if you look at the literature of uh, um, the extended CHC models, it corresponds to part where you have extensive electric field and uh, that was more or less discussed by Karin Chan uh, a few years ago. So uh, can you precise on the limits you expect on it? Yeah, I mean, of course you're right. There are many, many uh, uh, important aspects. But, but again, the point I make is that in principle, the computation hydrogen electrode here and many IFE application thermodynamics ends here. It's just a thermodynamic grand canonical concept, nothing more. Now, if you, for example, want to calculate capacitance, of course, then neglecting all the electronic effects, neglecting the explicit uh, uh, presence of the electropotential is, of course, not correct. But, but the, the, the very concept, I mean, in principle, the concept of hydrogen electron, as far as I understand it, you might look at the paper, is just a three-line thing. It's just, yeah, sure. we just, we just do grand, grand canonical simulations where we relate we have a uh, grand canonic ensemble and have particles uh, coming from a reservoir. Uh, and, and with respect to this, uh, there is, could, could not nothing be wrong. But of course, you see, this is here the problem. This yeah. is the problem. And uh, this is how, but I just, to make just, it's, it, uh, and of course, 99% of applications make this approximation. No, no doubt about that. 
but I would like to formally distinguish between the concept and the applications. This is my only point here. But you, of course, the points that you mentioned, when you do Pleasure. not do a proper uh, potential control, you make certainly many, many mistakes. I fully agree with you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other questions? Ah, yes, Simone, please. I have a question uh, regarding your ab initio molecular dynamics mm -hmm. simulation of the platinum water interface. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that you considered uh, like a neutral system, uh, so yeah. a system at the point of zero charge, and then you introduced explicitly a proton or you removed a proton, right? Mm -hmm. And but yeah, sure, when I, this is interesting because you mentioned point of zero charge. If you go to, to uh, if you read Trasati, what is the potential of zero charge? The potential of zero charge is the work function of an ion-free water film on the clean metal surface. So the only condition that corresponds off to the point of zero charge is this particular line. All the other simulations are no longer potential of zero charge simulations because we have no longer an ion-free water film. So, and in principle, you see, this is also an interesting point. And there were also concepts also by the Nurskov group. How could you change uh, in a in our posteriori sense the, the electropotential? And this is exactly the basis what we do by adding here, for example, here. What we do in time practically, we just put one hydrogen atom more into the water layer, nothing else, but of course, this hydrogen atom, where there's also charge. Where does the charge go? To the Fermi energy of the platinum, automatically. We don't anything. And of course, we can also hear sometimes, you see, there's also a difference whether we put the hydrogen atom on, on the surface or whether, whether we put it somewhere into the layer. And you see here also, then the uh, uh, potential is different. Of course, these are no equilibrium system, but by this, you can really effectively change the the electro potential. Now, it might be an hen or egg problem. When you do potential control, typically you think, okay, I have to change my firm energy. But if you change the firm energy, you also often change surface coverage. Or you can put it the other way. I change my surface kind of coverage, and then I change the dipole moment, and then I change also the surface energy. So I both are in principle two different sides of the coin. And so sorry that I interrupted you, but again, this is the only line which corresponds to, to the potential of zero charge. All are situations which corresponds to different potentials. And right. in fact, this might be the way to go to also have a certain potential control in this initial molecular dynamic simulations. Right, so, okay. So connecting to this point. So my question was this. So you are, by introducing a proton or removing a proton, you are mm -hmm. because your, your system is, Fairly small. You are sorry, sorry if I you, but he he's not introducing a proton. He's introducing an hydrogen yeah. atom, right? I guess. I guess. I please uh, uh, finish oh. your question. But I, I guess. Get, so we always consider charge neutral system, and this is also I like. I would like to make a very important point. Let me shake okay. this picture again. So so we never ever charge anything. And there's, I mean, we, we could also discuss for hours about charging. For example, the question, is the proton absorbed or hydrogen atom? And I think this is a badly posed question. When you have here hydrogen atom, you put it here, it doesn't matter whether it was before a proton or not. It's so strongly coupled to the Fermi energy, it doesn't care whether it was initially a proton or a hydrogen atom. This is, you just, and, and I also, in principle, when we talk, talk about charged electrolytes, in fact, this is, I mean, the very concept of the, of the electrical double layer is that the charge of the electrode is compensated by the electrical double layer. So in principle, if we are making the system large enough, it should be always charge neutral. Uh -huh. okay. So that's why we, in principle, I think there are good reasons to do charge neutral calculations. Of course, if you just use no electrolyte layer and then just consider the platinum electrode, there you make a mistake because there you can have surface charges. But if the, the double layer would be realistically modeled, then in principle, it's okay to perform charge neutral calculation. Okay. So, and again, all our calculations are always charge neutral in a DFT sense. We never used any background charge, counter charge whatsoever, but for the reasons that I just mentioned. Because my, my doubt was the following. Mm -hmm. So if you go back one slide, mm -hmm. So a change, uh, sorry, where you had the table, 
Uh, oh yeah, okay, that's false. This is, I'm, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this one. So, uh, so you are effectively modeling two different pH conditions. One is very acidic and one is very alkaline, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So corresponding to this change of pH, you see a difference of the absolute potential of around yeah. 0.2 electron volts. Yeah. So is this what you would have expected or would yeah. you have expected uh, like an Ernstian uh, shift of, uh, I don't know. Uh, what, what would be an Ernstian sh shift to be honest? No, no, but I, I would also like to make a point. For example, assume you have a pH of uh, like, let's say two or three, then you would have uh, one hydrogen atom out of 500, 5,500 5, water molecules. There's no way of that we can model this. Right. That's why we have here, you see the strong changes, 13.6 and 0.4. Exactly. But then on the other hand, my point would be when there is one hydrogen atom among 5,500 water molecules, do we really need to explicitly take into account? But the, then the question is, of course, it introduces something there. It introduces change of the electropotential. And this is, should be properly mentioned. But you see, I'm, what I'm discussing, it's all from an atomistic point of view. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why, of course, this, the unfortunate thing is when you have only 144 water molecules and change, uh, enter just one pH, uh, one, then you, you make a strong change already in the molarity of this. Thank you. So, so in practice here, you when you absorb a species at the surface, you mm -hmm. can only calculate a posteriori which which potentially corresponds yes. to, right? Yes. Okay. In principle, yes. Okay. I mean, you see, but still, my this would be my approach. Of course, you see here we in principle we are here in a good situation. Uh, if you, uh, I should go back here. So the important point with uh, okay, no, no, here the very important point with platinum surface is that you have here a double layer region. This is experimentally well known. This is the region where, where platinum is, when you don't have uh, sulfates or so, you would have here OH covered surface. But there's always a region where it's not covered. So we, are, we have the good luck that this situation here corresponds still to the double layer region around 0 0.4, 0 0.5 volts. Of course, if we want to, but, but still, if we want to model a situation which corresponds to, let's say, 0 0. 0. 0.2 volts with relax, then we would need this hydrogen layer here. So, so my, 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 the, the, in principle, my, our recipe would be first to a grand canonical simulation. As I say, if you want to do simulation of a system around whatever zero volts, then determine the right surface structure. Typically, you will then have a cat, cations that sort of the surface, and then use this structure uh, with the uh, epinitial molecular dynamic simulation. Epinitial molecular dynamic simulation are no tool to determine any equilibrium structure. You can't do this. I mean, the, 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 you would need huge cells, there, so there, there is no way of using them to really find equilibrium structures as far as the adsorbates are concerned. You will have, because you would need to put the right amount of adsorbates as ions at the surface, and so there's no way out. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So I think uh, we should stop here, so yeah. thank you again. Yeah, thank you um, for your attention. So thank you very much. And I have to thank you for inviting me. I forgot to say this. Yeah. Uh, <laughs>